Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today to celebrate the Emmy nomination for American Masters for Outstanding Documentary or Nonfiction Series. My name is Marajan Safinia, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and the former longtime board president of the International Documentary Association, and I'm excited to be here for this conversation. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the series American Masters and also about the representative film for the series, Terence McNally, Every Act of Life. I'm excited to introduce these fine people who just popped up as if by magic around me. Um, so I'll start with Michael Cantor. Since 1986, American Masters has set the standard for documentary film profiles and has won 28 Emmy Awards, including 10 in this category. The series asks who has changed America and illuminates the stories of our cultural giants. Um, so this is Michael Cantor, the executive uh, producer for the series, who's run the series since 2014 and has overseen the production of 60 documentaries on subjects such as Maya Angelou and Scott Marmaday and Raul Julia. Also joining us are the creative team behind Terence McNally, Every Act of Life, producer-director Jeff Kaufman and producer Marsha Ross. Together they have collaborated on a number of projects, including The State of Marriage, Father Joseph, and the Savoy King, Chick Webb, and the music that changed America. But I think they're perhaps best known for their collaboration on life as husband and wife. Welcome, Jeff and Marsha. And last but certainly not least, we're joined by Michael Yuri, actor, presenter, director, and producer, who lit up our screens with his unforgettable portrayal of Mark St. James, the fierce and fabulous nemesis of Betty Suarez in ADC's hit show, Ugly Betty. Unforgettable, I still, I, I miss those performances. He's also appeared in Modern Family, The Good Wife, and Hot in Cleveland, as well as on stage in Grand Horizons, Torch Song Trilogy, and Angels in America, just to name a few. Welcome everybody. Congratulations on your nomination. Uh, I know it's a bit bittersweet to celebrate the film at this moment, uh, given that Terence himself isn't with us anymore. Um, Terence passed away from COVID at the beginning of this pandemic in March. Um, and he was the first American celebrity to really die of the disease. And, um, and we'll get to talking about that a little bit later. Um, Michael Yuri, I would like to start with you. I know you have to leave us a little bit early this evening. Um, but everyone, please jump in with your reflections. I, you know, let's have a warm conversation. Um, so one of the things that struck me when I was watching this film was the kind of impact that Terence uh, had on the lives of those who worked with him um, and who got to act in his plays and his profound relationship um, and rigor around his words and with the actors you know, who spoke them. Um, and when I think about the enormity of cultural influence that uh, Terence had, it's, it's really kind of, it's breathtaking to sort of look at that entire body of work. Um, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Terence, um, where it started and what kind of influence and impact he had on your life? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and congratulations on the nomination, you guys. It's really, really cool. It's a beautiful documentary. And uh, I'm so, so I'm, lo I'm very happy to be here. Any, any chance I get to talk about Terrence is, is, is one worth taking. Um, I would say my first experience with Terrence was in the play library of my high school speech and debate club, where I discovered um, Love, Valor, Compassion and learned a lot about myself. Um, I uh, also, around that time, the movie had come out and watching that movie was very eye-opening to me, not just because of the themes, but because it's such a beautiful, beautiful text. Mm -hmm. His plays mm -hmm. are epic. Um, that one uh, um, is no exception. It's uh, so much beautiful language, such rich characters, um, and, and about something so meaningful. And uh, it was that play, that that play, along with Angels in America and uh, Torch Song, and as is these these really uh, seminal plays that um, helped me know who I was, understand you know my own sexuality, but also uh, make me fall in love with the theater. And um, I, it, you know, that that love of theater, my the first play I ever directed in high school was Lips Together, Teeth Apart. I talked uh, my buddy into directing me in, by the way, high schoolers doing Lips Together, Teeth Apart was very strange. Um, <laughs> at the time, I thought it was great, but looking back, it must have been silly. But then I talked my friend in community college into directing me in um, Terrence's short play, Sweet Eros. 
and then I did scenes from lots of his plays all through Juilliard, and um, and and my first Broadway show, the first show I saw on Broadway was Ragtime, which he directed, uh, which he sorry, which he wrote the book to. So I have lots of firsts when it comes to Terrence, um, and. I got to know him a little bit. He came to see everything. He went to see everything. He was always so generous with me uh, and, 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 and always took so much time uh, backstage. He would come see me in the dumpiest theaters um, be, because I think because he, he, he uh, knew that I made choices based on great plays. I read, I, I, I like to do great plays, um, even if they're in, in, you know, dumpy theaters. Some of the best things I've ever done have been in dumpy theaters. And some of them have been started by Terrence. I mean, I remember him coming to see Buyer and Seller, a one man play that I was in that started with the Rattlestick, which he and his former partner basically started uh, a, a, a great West Village institution that basically started. Um, and then, um, and then uh, we got to know each other. I did some readings of some of his plays in his living room. Uh, I was almost in one of his plays, uh, but it ended up not happening. And then uh, last year, we started the Pride Plays Festival. Doug Nevin, Nick Mayo, and I started a, a queer theater festival at the Rattlestick. Uh, we did 19 play readings in uh, five days, and we wanted to pick a play uh, that we found seminal um, to the canon of queer work. Um, and that also kind of helped tell the story of where we came from. And the most perfect example of that was a play that Terrence wrote called Some Men, which took place from the 1930s until the aughts. Uh, and it was, it was gay men through all of that time. And it was usually done with eight actors playing many, many different men in all of these vignettes. Um, and we thought, what better way to blow this out as our big grand finale of the first ever Pride Plays, but to cast every role. So instead of eight men in Some Men, we had 60. Um, we should have called it Many Men. Um, but we, we, <laughs> we got the title Some Men. And we got a lot of great um, Terrence uh, stalwarts like John Benjamin Hickey and uh, Stephen Spinella and Bobby Steggert and... Um, an amazing cast. Uh, Logan Reed, his his assistant and dear friend, directed it for us. And Terrence came. Terrence and Tom were sitting there in, in the audience. Jeff and Marsha were there too. And it was a very hot night. We found out later the air conditioning was, um, two of the vents of the air conditioning were not open, which led to that. But it was a very hot night. No one left. Uh, we had 60 men on stage performing this play. And um, and we thought what we, we thought you know Ter Terrence by the way Terrence never stopped writing um, he was constantly writing there are there have to be dozens of plays in a drawer somewhere that we will find someday but we thought he's so game he was he was like a kid all the way until the end we thought he's so game this play was written in 2008 or six I can't remember it's now 2019 so much has happened to gay men since then. Um, not the least of which is marriage equality. Uh, but we also had a guy running for president who was gay um, at the time. And we thought, I wonder if Terrence would be interested in um, updating his play. And so we just mentioned it casually. We we're like, is there anything else you want to say about these characters? Or is there anything you want to say uh, about now that isn't in the play? And he wrote a scene. Um, and he insisted that I be in it, which was, I, I, I mean, which was like one of those, I, I, it was always, I always had to pinch myself anytime he knew my name, much less asked me to be in something, much less said, I wrote this for you. But it was a scene between uh, Pete Buttigieg and Chaston. And it, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was the night Pete decides to run for president. And it was a very simple scene. Uh, them in bed together, having this beautiful conversation, and then Chaston falls asleep, and Pete kind of speaks, just uh, sort of um, um, pontificates about America and about um, being a soldier and a gay man in America, and um, and we did it, one performance only that night, 
as the closer of the Pride Place Festival. And I will never forget it. I, I mean, I will never forget getting to originate a role. It was my chance. I got to, I, I, I got to originate a part and it was the first gay man to run for president and mm. Terrence wrote it. And it was, mm. it was amazing. It was very, very, very special. And, and, and every actor who he touched has a story like that, where at some point they felt like they were the only actor in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, we do take so much for granted right now that we're in 2020, that um, the cultural normalization of queerness, having a gay man, an openly gay man run for president um, and perhaps soon to be nominated for a cabinet, we hope. Um, um, one of the things that struck me in the film was a line from F. Murray Abram talking about the Ritz. And he says that mm -hmm. his character in that was, you know, outrageously gay, but also the sanest character in, in the story. Um, and Billy Porter talks about sort of standing on, on Terence's shoulders. Um, as someone who's a generation or two, I would guess, younger than Terence was, um, What's the impact of that kind of domino effect of the courage he had and the transformative kind of power of representation um, on you personally and also on, on the larger LGBTQ movement? It, it, very profound, uh, enormous. He, he gave us all of these plays to see ourselves in. Um, for actors, he gave us all these plays to, 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 uh, to play ourselves. Um, in, but he also was the first major playwright, not the first gay major playwright at all, as we know, but the first major playwright to write about us, uh, to write about the queer, the queer experience, the, the major playwright. I mean, of course, there were others that, um, that were writing about the queer experience, but they weren't getting traction. They weren't getting, um, they weren't getting the kind of uh, 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 Broadway theaters certainly that Terrence was getting. He had so many plays on Broadway and, and, and he, he never compromised. He never settled and he never, he never shied away from that. And I think that, you know, that, like, yes, of course, Edward Albee, a gay man wrote incredible plays and maybe they were about gay people, but they weren't, they weren't, there weren't gay people on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't, there weren't gay people uh, on the page. Uh, and Terrence did that. He stood up before anybody else. And that kind of courage, I mean, B Billy's absolutely right. We all stand, we all stand on his, you know, we all stand on his shoulders. Um, he, he paved the way for um, all of us to, to be able to represent ourselves because he, he said, he, he, he said before anybody else did, he said, I'm going to write about me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why his plays were the ones that I first gravitated towards. Uh, even when I didn't really know what I was, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know what Lips Together, Teeth Apart was about in high school. I just loved it. I loved the words. Uh, I loved him. I loved the setting. I loved all, all of that stuff. It wasn't until years later that I really understood that what it, what, what it meant for him to write a play about AIDS with straight characters and put it on Broadway with Nathan Lane and Christine Baranski. That was a major step um, that I, I, I mean, if I had a, I think if I had a time machine and I could go back and see any of Terrence's plays that I missed, it would be that. I would want to sit in a Broadway theater and watch a Broadway audience watch a play like that in the middle of that epidemic. Mm. That's truly from, from major epidemic to major epidemic. I'm also struck just thinking about, uh, you know, the exciting political news that we all got yesterday. The profound, you know, representation profoundly matters. It totally changes your sense of possibility in the world to see yourself um, and I think that's you know one of the great gifts of, of his legacy. Um, Michael Cantor, other Michael, Michael number two in this uh, scenario. Um, can we talk a little bit about American Masters as, as a show and a strand? Um, I was lucky to just uh, premiere my most recent work on PBS and I've been thinking a lot about the role and the sort of treasure that PBS is in our cultural landscape. Um, and especially in the documentary landscape where things have shifted a lot in the last 10 years and we've sort of moved into this kind of corporate age of documentary, um, which really changes content. Um, so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about, you know, why is it so important that we see and celebrate the stories of our cultural giants in American life? And why is it so vital maybe now more than ever 
that we remember, you know, these stories of sort of the best aspects of American life when it, uh, it seems that daily when we turn on our TVs, um, we're confronted with other aspects. <laughs> she said, trying to be awfully diplomatic, other <laughs> aspects of American life. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the, you know, the real value that PBS kind of programming holds in our cultural landscape? Well, sure. American Masters is dedicated to the idea that there are people who've changed our culture. Terrence McNally being, being a, you know, one of the greats, along with other great writers, whether it's Lorraine Hansberry or Maya Angelou or Arthur Miller. Um, you know, there's this idea that if we look carefully at their work and at what drove them to write that work, we can better understand who we are as Americans. That's that's kind of Ken Burns' line about all of his work. That PBS across the board is trying to help us understand our culture um, not, and, and, and entertain along the way. I think um, this year's season speaks to our strong interest in the diversity of the, the uh, different aspects of our culture, whether it's a film on the great Kiowa uh, Pulitzer Prize winning writer N. Scott Mamaday or Ursula Le Guin, a pioneering um, sci-fi writer, and uh, Raul Julia, um, or Mark Rothko, who was an immigrant from Russia before kind of changing the face of painting. But I think Terence, as, as Michael so eloquently said, he really changed the face of theater because he spoke the truth about um, gay life in a way that no one had. Um, and what was so interesting is the way Jeff and Marsha sort of wove in a really intimate but super compelling biography. So you understood about his background in Corpus Christi and how you know he had this abusive father and his brother is telling you about uh, the family, family dynamics that drove him from Texas to New York and, and, and how, you know, what a difference there was between say him as a person and Edward Albee, who he was linked to in the film in real life. Um, so it's really a beautiful weaving of, of the two things that American Masters is after, which is what was the work that changed um, America and who was the person behind the work? And that's what we, we try and do deep dives. We don't try and kind of just, you know, grab a few clips here and there. And I think again, to their credit, Jeff and Marsha and, and their team did what's very difficult, which is to put theater on television. Mm. Um, they didn't obviously show an entire show the way great performances does, but PBS is the home for the arts on television. With, with rare exceptions, sometimes Spike Lee will shoot a show that ends up on HBO. But if you, if you tune into public television, you'll see you know, great dance, theater, arts, in a way that no one else does. And, and I'm just so proud of this film and, and this particular season. Um, because of what it represents. Just to dig in a little bit more about that, and Michael Yuri, I know you are on a ticking clock, so when you need to make your graceful stage exit, do something fabulous and okay. we shall let you go with love. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, um, Michael Cantor, um, when we think about this idea of diversity, but all, you know, in, in terms of content, in terms of makers, right, as well, the, the people who get to tell the stories, but also in terms of the extraordinary reach of public television. I mean, I think this is one of these things that we, um, we've had our heads turned by kind of a new landscape and there's plenty that's super exciting about the new landscape, but there is something really profound about the reach of public television and the way that it reaches, what is it, 98% of American homes? Households, yeah. Well, yeah. let's just first speak to the fact that this film and the other films that I just mentioned are streaming for free at you know, pbs.org American Masters. But before Michael goes, I would love to hear, you know, this film aired in Pride Month last year, um, or this, in Pride Month. And um, there's something so important about reaching 98% of the homes with this particular story and with the kind of very upfront life that, that Terrence led in terms of his partners, in terms of his work, and I just think you might have a, you, you were so eloquent earlier about gay plays and so on. I thought you might have, you might be able to offer something on that. Oh, thanks. Sure. Yeah. It, 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 it that it reached that many people that, that a, a, an unapologetic 
unashamed man who 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 was willing and able to you know and so good at putting um, that on on a stage um, was was it, I'm sorry my cats <laughs> my cats trying to get out of the room um, um, zoom um, but, uh, but, uh, that he was that he was uh, so uh, open and unapologetic and and how. You know, I learned so much about him from the movie he, when I saw it. I saw it actually at Outfest in L.A. That's when I first saw it, um, which is a, a gay, a, a, a LGBTQ film festival in Los Angeles. And I watched it in a giant theater filled with queer people. And it was so exciting and um, to, to, to learn so many things that I didn't know about his early life. And I'm from Texas, too. So, so I know what it's like growing up. I mean, I grew up, obviously, many years later. Uh, and, and I know what it's like. So imagining what a pioneer he had to have been to uh, have gotten out of that Texas and to have gotten, um, and also to have been in a relationship with Edward Albee, who was so different than Terrence in so many ways. You know, he, he, he I didn't know him. I, I, I spent one day with him once. Um, uh, I was his, his escort for the day when he was given an honorary doctorate at Juilliard. Um, and I, so I spent a little bit of time with him and it was while the goat was playing and, and he was very cold. Um, he was nice. He was perfectly nice. And, 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 and we had some nice talks and I, I loved the goat and I talked to him about the goat. And so he was nice to me, but he was a cold individual. He seemed cranky. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, and, and, and then, and then it was, you, you don't hear a lot of nice things about him. Um, you know, you hear that he was tough, that he was mean, that he was, um, that he was, you know, a crank and, and you feel that in his plays, his brilliant plays. But you, you, you. But Terence's Terence, first of all, leads with warmth, led with warmth, um, kindness. You never hear anybody say anything bad about Terence McNally, and his plays were about connecting. All these plays are about tearing apart from one another. Terence said, "I'm gay. I'm going to write about gay people, and I'm going to bring them together and show you what a chosen family can be." Mm -hmm. And um, so, so, so like learning about him, what I already knew, what, what the movie shows, knowing that like 98% of households were going to get that, that's, that's a really beautiful thing. And, and, you know, as pride, you know, last year pride, global pride became so commercial, became such a corporate thing. Everybody, you know, no, no, there was no fast food restaurant without a pride flag in their window, which is great. You know, it's like, great. It, it, it's a, it's, it seems a, a little, um, um, maybe a, 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 a little, I don't know, um, a little forced, but I'll take it. Um, to, to watch Pride become that, I mean, Terrence probably could never have imagined Pride become something like that. And so now Pride Month is, is for everyone. Um, and, and, and so to flip on your TV and see a story about a gay man who got out of Texas and wrote plays and won Tonys and um, and changed a bunch of lives. That is, um, it's a really beautiful thing, and it's the kind of thing that only PBS can do. And you're right, you know, like when you think about the theater, especially now, while we can't go to theaters, the amount of times I have looked for a play, and it's and I found it on great performances, or 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 it was originally done on PBS, or or I think I need some theater right now. I'll go I'll go find. I mean, I, Into the Woods, Great Performance's version of Into the Woods was a life-changing experience for me when I saw that, when I saw what a Broadway theater really looked like, you know, from Texas and Plano, or I'm from Plano, Texas, but in Dallas, I went to see musicals in this giant 4,000-seat barn at the state fairgrounds. That's where I went to see my theater, and then I see Into the Woods on my TV screen, and I see the audience, and it, there's, there's only hundreds, and that's... That's an experience that only uh, only television can share with the world, mm -hmm. um, and you know, like there's obviously other places you can watch Hamilton on Disney Plus. You can watch a Spike Lee um, produced movie on HBO, but but the 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 amount of the, the amount of uh, uh, the, the the scope that you get when you watch things on PBS is on on there's no there's nobody else there's nobody else that's doing that. It's, un, it's unpar unparalleled. 
it's a cultural treasure. Listen, your cat upstaged you. Your cat totally got out of that room without any assistance. <laughs> so you should go and investigate what is up with your talented cat. Thank you for joining us, Michael. I really appreciate Thank your time. You Thank, Thank you. you. Flourish. <laughs> Good luck. I hope I hope you all win. It's such a beautiful movie and a beautiful beautiful season, Michael. Thank you, Jeff and Marcia, for making it. Marjan, thank you so much for a beautiful Thanks conference. for joining us, Thank Michael. you, Michael. All right, Jeff and Marsha, you feel like you want to get in on this game? Do you feel like you may have a little <laughs> something to say? Um, can I can I say a couple things? First of all, sure. you know, and Jeff, as I think, said this before, but it was really Terrence's dream to have this film be on American Masters. I mean, at one point, you know, we were, you know, filming one day and he pulls Jeff aside, you know, when you're making the film, as you know, because you're a filmmaker, Marjan, you know, you don't know what, you know, you hope that your film is going to have a life. You want your film to have a life, but you don't really know at that point where it's going. And Jeff says to him, you know, well, we'll do everything we can. You know, it's like, you can't promise it. But then, thank you, Michael Cantor, because I mean, it was, you know, and I am so glad that, you know, Terrence was alive, you know, to see it on American Masters, to, to, to be part of really the launch of the film there. I, it made, a, it meant a great deal to him. And I, I think it, it's continuing to mean a great deal to people who were close to Terrence um, because of COVID, people cannot, have not been able to really mourn him properly. I mean, haven't been able to have a proper memorial and really celebrate his incredible life. And having the film on American Masters, we hear from people all the time. Somehow they've been watching it multiple times and they've been able to really, um, you know, celebrate his life personally through being able to have this opportunity there. So it's, it's been very meaningful to, to Jeff, and, Jeff and I, me. Yeah. I can throw out one more PBS connection. Uh, we can probably do PBS connections for the rest of the, uh, the, the program. Uh, but um, uh, Terrence won an Emmy for writing Andre's Mother on PBS. And he actually did a number of wonderful uh, teleplays for PBS. So that was an important part of his life and another nice award <laughs> on his shelf. Um, but it just goes to show that uh, Terrence was a person from many mediums. Mm. You know, my, Michael said something else too. Um, and I know Michael, is a great theater lover uh, as well. Um, and I am, and I, my parents took me to the theater as a child and I continued to go all my life. I grew up in New York. I love, love the theater. And I had seen much of Terrence's work, you know, at Manhattan Theater Club, actually, you, you know, Lips Together and, and uh, I, uh, you know, Love Valor. And, and, and then I came to California and I saw Ragtime and uh, Masterclass and many other things, you know, here actually in Los Angeles. But um, making the film, it was so interesting. And you touched upon this, Michael, getting to know the man behind the writing. Because as we learned about his life making the film, you really see how much of him is in these plays. It, it, it's, it's, you know, if, it's really, it was fascinating to me, you know, how much he put in. And, and then, you know, from a casting point of view, and, and, and Michael Yuri touched upon it, um, you know, he had his his sort of surrogate actors who were really him. He liked to use the same people. And I think I'll just say one last thing about that, which is that Terrence McNally was the ultimate fan. I mean, he loved actors and he discovered actors. And, um, you know, I always told him, I think you, in another life you were a casting director because he was always discovering people. And, um, and another thing, which I don't think Michael Cantor knows, but you know, Terrence wrote thank you notes after the film to every single person mm -hmm. in the theater, in the film rather, that we interviewed every person in the film, he wrote a thank you note to, and, wow. and he went backstage at, to see Brian Cranston and he thanked, you know, he thanked Brian Cranston for being in the film. It was really incredible. What a class act. I yeah. wish people still did that. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just want to quote one thing that I can't remember who said in the film, but it, it's, I think it's going to be one of, you know, how Prince used to put those little maxims on his board. And someone, I think it was Terrence McNally's high school English teacher, Mrs. McElroy or what have you, who said his integrity was his armor. Yeah. And I think in today's world where we're all trying to figure out every, everybody's so anxious about everything that, that that's a really wonderful maxim that he brought to his work and to himself. And when I got, I had the pleasure of meeting him, um, you know, after the film was done. And you just got the sense that this guy was very forthright and, and he couldn't be more, whatever the term is for have more integrity.
Yeah, you know, uh, Marjan used the word courage earlier when she was talking to Michael Yuri. Um, and that's one of the things I think is so wonderful about Terrence. You know, he, he has sort of this quiet, wry demeanor or had, but there was this fierce courage inside him, both A, to keep trying uh, new creative challenges that would scare the heck out of someone else, uh, but also um, to put things on stage and, and to do things in his own life that really set uh, the bar for others. And I think that comes from that kind of integrity. And one of the things I was thinking about was that um, sadly, I feel like so many people have in certain places in public trust have lost that sense of courage, that sense of Terrence always talks about, you gotta be true to yourself, that sense of being true to yourself. And you see, and he talks about how as an individual, if you're not true to yourself, it, it corrodes your heart, your soul. Remember that line from the film? And I think we see that as a country. Um, if people cede some big part of themselves for some gain, if they're not true to themselves, I think it ends up hurting us as a whole as well. So, you know, Terrence just speaks to so many things. Mm -hmm. Jeff, can you talk to us a little bit? I mean, uh, you know, I, I was struck as I was watching and at some point sort of about three quarters of the way through, you just have to throw like a whole screen of work titles up, right? Because the volume of work is just, is just mine. I mean, I can't get my head around it, right? So how did you, as a, from a storytelling perspective, from a filmmaker's perspective, you know, with such an enormous canvas to draw on, how did you distill that down into sort of a tight, whatever it is, 80 something close to 90 minutes? You know, it's funny because if someone is really famous for one great play, um, it's kind of easy because you have, you know, you could wrap it around that play. And one of the challenges we faced and talked about at the beginning was he's done so much work. And uh, Marcia said something that really set the bar for, for the film, which was that she said, this film has to work for people who know nothing about the theater and for people who know everything about the theater. Somehow it has to work and connect for both. Um, so part of that was uh, trying to make him and the people he knew uh, as real as possible. Uh, but we also wanted to find a way to get into each play individually so that we never try to want to use the same framework for telling Love, Valor, Compassion or Lipstick, or Teeth Apart or A Perfect Ganesh. We wanted each one to have their own stylistic approach. Um, and, uh, and that also, I think, reflects the diversity of Terrence's interests. Uh, but, um, you know, and then when you just burrow in and you find the materials, hopefully it leads you to the right way to tell it. And how, um, what was the genesis? Did you have a pre-existing relationship with him or how did it come to be that you made this film? Actually, um, we, Marsha and I did a film uh, about the origins of the marriage equality movement and really how um, almost the entire foundation of the modern marriage equality movement that's changed so many different lives uh, rested on the shoulders of three really remarkable women, uh, two in Vermont who never got the credit they deserved. There were others as well, but they just did groundbreaking work in the 1990s in Vermont that showed the way in the courts, in private life uh, and politically for the rest of the movement. Um, and uh, we wanted to, as part of that story, talk about someone who came to Vermont to have a, a marriage, to have a civil union. And we discovered that Terrence McNally and Tom Curtihy, his love of his life and a wonderful person, um, that, uh, that they had uh, their first union uh, in Vermont. Um, so we got an introduction and, uh, and then prior to even filming with them, we were saying, you know, no one's ever told Terrence's story. How is that possible? It seemed like impossible. And so we said, if we like him, if he likes us, if we connect, uh, maybe we can do a film about him. And that's what led to this. And he was willing, very willing, it seems like, to, to tell the story. Yeah, I would like to defer to the others, but let me just say just briefly that sitting down for the first time with Terrence and Tom uh, and having expectations that Terrence um, could have been an imperious person, Marsha and I were so blown away by just how instantly open he decided to be. I think it was a conscious choice, but it was because he was talking about Tom, it was one of the most loving things I've ever experienced in my life. Mm. I was very struck actually by him talking about what he's, what was most important to him was not success, but was love, like an, an authentic love. And, um, you know, we don't speak about those things very often, you know, in, in that sort of very real way. Uh, can you reflect a little bit on this sort of theme that we were talking about with Michael Yuri before he left? I mean, the courage in his time, you know, the, the, to be that cutting edge 
right? And that un unapologetic and, and really fearless. I mean, that's some high stakes stuff to sort of put that narrative out there, even though mm -hmm. in a public sphere, right? Because it wasn't only, it was not only gay people, he was not only making theater for gay people. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how he grappled with some of those decisions um, and what some of the repercussions may or may not have been for him um, of taking such a crazy risk, you know, back back then in the whatever, 50s, 60s? Well, let, me, let me just start and then I'll pass it to, to Michael and Marsha. But uh, when Terrence wrote his first play, it was on Broadway. It was about, had a positive gay character and Terrence was openly gay as a writer. And that was at a time when his partner Edward Albee was in the closet, William Inge was in the closet, Thornton Wilder was in the closet, uh, even Tennessee Williams was in the closet. Uh, and there was great risk that you could destroy your career by just being who you are. But uh, Terrence just instinctively knew that that was the path he had to take. Yeah, I just, I, oh, go, go ahead, Michael. Marcia. No, you go ahead. I'd, sec I'd second that in that we have a film coming up on, on Oliver Sacks, uh, directed by Rick Burns. Sacks, of course, the famous writer and, and neurologist, physician, uh, doctor. And someone points out in the film, if he had come out as gay in the 60s, right when Terrence is writing this play, he would have literally been defrocked. They would have taken his medical license away because at that point it was still somehow considered a disease. Um, but what I'd, I'd also like to just chime in on is this idea of what, what Jeff and Marsha have done, which is so special and why we're so proud that this film is part of American Masters is, you know, I think of the theater as, and it's, it's maybe a cliched idea, but it's a barometer of our culture. And, you know, Yip Harburg said of, of songs from the theater that they literally are the barometer. You can see how we're happy, we're violent, we're angry, we're sad, listen to the songs. I think actually the songs no longer are the barometer. You don't hear songs about starting with the Iraq war. Um, the songs don't reflect it nearly as much as this kind of arc of a life, writing for different people in different eras, the, the cast that the, the people that Terrence influenced is just staggering. I mean, Jeff and Marsha can speak to who, who joined in to speak on the, in the film, but all the great writers and, and performers, Rita Moreno and John Robin Bates and so on, um, you really feel not only that, that courageousness and that love, but you have an arc of American history as seen through these different pieces. And that, that's when a film works on those different levels, that's when we really get excited about something. I have to beg my forgiveness because I am now on my way into a Q&A for my project, but I'm going to hand the <laughs> reins over to you guys who have them anyway um, to continue the conversation for the rest of the hour. And I'm just so grateful you asked me to, to participate in this. And I feel you know so much better for having watched this film and I hope everybody watches it and I hope you win that Emmy. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Margo. you. All right. Thanks so Bye -bye. much. Hey, Michael and Marsha, can I ask you a question and throw it to you guys? Is that okay? Yeah, I used to, used to be a radio talk show host in my childhood. So. <laughs> uh, but I wonder, you know, Michael, we're talking about um, uh, um, this strange time, you know, in, of COVID and isolation and trying to connect um, and worries about the theater getting back on its feet. What do you think the repercussions will be from this isolation, both for the theater, for television, and how people... Um, experience things? Wow. Well, my wife um, actually runs a presenting organization and um, everybody, Broadway, off-Broadway, they're trying to figure it out right now. I know um, from my perspective that the theater community itself, I think, is hurting as much or more than any community in the country um, in that, you know, they can't do their thing and we all miss it. Uh, those of us who love the theater. Um, I think television, on the other hand, and what you all have done is in this extraordinary moment of everyone's stuck at home and we all have TV screens, we all have um, you know, computer monitors, and we can share those same stories. It's not, we're not together, but we can be touched the, the way that theater touches us through television. Um, and through documentaries. So I think this is, you know, people were talking about it's a golden age for documentaries. There's so many platforms, but I think the fact is more people want to watch documentaries because they want truth. I think that's another aspect of, of, 
of our political culture now that there's this emphasis on you know truth and what's not truth, what's fake. Um, and I think PBS and your film and um, and the arts that are presented are an opportunity for, for people to feel things that are truthful, whether it's in a fictional story and it's an emotional truth, or it's in a documentary and you're learning about you know how shocking the Ritz was in the middle of the '60s and what it meant to Rita Moreno, who who wins a Tony and and so on. Um, so I I just think it's um, I think the film is right for its its time. Can we make a little plug that there's going to be a Rita Moreno American Masters as well? Yes, R Rita Moreno film is in the works along with as I mentioned Oliver Sacks, a lot of other great great projects. There's one. Um, that hasn't been announced. Well, we, we just announced one called How It Feels to Be Free that Alicia Keys is executive producing. And it's about black women entertainer, you know, pioneers like Lena Horne and Nina Simone. Um, and so it makes sense why Alicia Keys was drawn to that subject. But I, I wanna hear more from Marsha about her her sense of, of Terrence in the making of the film. Well, you know, it's funny because you know, I spent a lot of time with Terrence in the in-betweens, you know, we would chat. And of course, my great love of theater, we had much to, much to talk about. And he was very nervous at first, you know, and I remember we, we were um, working in a space, the Abington Theater Company, where they were renovating their theater space down, I think it's like 32nd or 33rd Street. And they gave us the whole theater space. And, you know, we had him there for an entire week that the first time we interviewed him. And he said, to, you know, he said to me, well, I don't know, I, you know, I, I could do this if you were interviewing me, like for one of the plays that I wrote, but I'm talking about myself. I don't think I'm going to have anything to say. And, you know, and, but I think, you know, once he kind of, the camera went on him and he started to really talk, you know, he started to actually talk about things he had never spoken about in his life. And I think when he did see the film the first time we showed it to him, he was actually very surprised by his own openness, actually. And some of the things that he said, uh, you, you know, that he had never revealed to anybody. And another really interesting thing we learned from his brother, Peter, actually, is that, you know, one of the things that had been really important to, to Terrence was to protect his brother from what went on in the family household. And of course, he hadn't seen what Peter had to say until he saw the film. And this was a very big thing for him to realize that, you know, his brother hadn't known what was going on. And Peter and, and Terrence were very, very close on a tremendous relationship. And, um, you know, it was a lot of things like that. You know, Terrence just opened up about things he'd never really spoken about before. And um, it was very move moving at times, you know? No question. I, I just noticed another thing that I took away from the, the film that, that I think speaks to more than the film itself. But what, what somebody said, maybe it was Billy Porter said, the Terrence Wright's play is not necessarily about being gay, but about not being accepted. And again, that's one of these kind of universal truths that any yeah. viewer can connect with. Yeah, and that was actually Cheryl Cowler, the wonderful director, speaking to Billy Porter at a, at a table reading. But you're right. And you know, I mean, if you look at the diversity of Terrence's work, it's the, as Michael was saying, the seminal plays uh, about the gay experience, but also Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune. Um, and uh, ragtime, and uh, you know, a, a diverse range of plays that that touched a lot of different kind of lives. But there was always that universality, um, and also I think that sense of of humanity. There was never a bad guy. There was he was always trying to get inside people to see who they really were. Well, what Audrey said, Audrey said that Terrence sees that everybody has their own opera inside them. You mm -hmm. know, Terrence was a big opera lover. And then he said that about people. But, you know, going back on what Jeff was saying, you know, Terrence, I think was really unique in, 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 in the theater in that, you know, he wrote comedies, he wrote drama, he wrote books for very successful books for musical, which is a very underrated talent. Very few people can do, you know, it's not that easy to do. Um, and he had like Ragtime and the Full Monty and, and several many other shows and operas too. But he, but, and then, you know, he wrote incredible roles for women. I mean, he wasn't just write roles for gay men, which was very unique, but he wrote extraordinary roles for women and relationships between men and women, because I think he recognized that, you know, the universality in, in all of us. And, you know, and I think, Jeff knows I always say this, but I think one of the things I'm most taken with when Terrence says in the film, you know, Bobby 
wanted to be you know successful more than he wanted to be in love and i just wanted to have a great, good relationship i wanted to be in love and and i think that was a very driving force in his life you know finding love and connecting to other people and it didn't really you know he didn't isolate it into one group of people you know it, it goes through everything he's done it speaks to something really profound too because um you know michael yuri was talking about uh about Edward Albee, and of course Albee um, mentored a lot of young playwrights and, and, and had a very positive personal impact on a lot of people's lives, but he talked about the complications of having, of, of, of not always being the best person you could be, as opposed to Terrence. Um, and, and so ultimately that, it's that thing, what do you leave behind? You know, and if you leave an edifice of successful work, but you've trashed everyone in your life, what's that really worth? And I, and I so, one of the things that's most gratifying is not just having someone say, oh, I love Terrence's play, but having someone say uh, either A, you know, like the wonderful writer Matthew Lopez saying, oh, when I was nothing, Terrence gave me uh, time and attention and, and it changed my life. Or even someone from far away who never met him saying, I read his work and it changed my life. That's the thing that's really special. But I, again, to, to piggyback off that, I think what's really special about your film, and I don't know, how many of the folks have seen it? If you haven't, it's free streaming on the pbs.org American Masters site, as well as the, the film's website. But um, the way that you captured, in particular, two of the great leading ladies of American theater, um, Audra McDonald and Marin Maisie, and you talked about a legacy. You know, when, when we did this film on Mike Nichols, um, it was an opportunity. People came up and afterwards and said, boy, that was like spending another hour with Mike Nichols, you know, the, an hour that we'll never have again. And when you got to see certain performances and in particular, Marin Maisie on the screen singing, um, I, I really just think your, your selection of moments and, um, and people in particular it is a legacy. It's the kind of thing where you feel like you're spending time with Terrence, who's no longer with us, but also you're, you're feeling the evolution of his art through the people that he influenced. And that's very powerful. I mean, he was, as a, going back again, you know, he was a wonderful, great lover of talent. And Michael Urey was right. He went to see everything. You know, he went to see, I mean, it's how he found Joe Montello, even as, you know, both of us as a director. But, you know, he was constantly finding actors like Nathan Lane and, you know, other actors were casting people when you didn't expect them to see them. And, and he would write for them and, and, and he believed in them. He, as, as you say, he did the same with playwrights too. I mean, he mentored so many people and he was, didn't hesitate to help people. It was, it was pre, it's pretty remarkable. And I think one of the things that was very funny when we premiered the film at Tribeca, and I, you know, there was, it was Nathan and Mar I think it was Nathan and Murray and Joe, and I think they were all sitting like, you know, right in front of me and, you know, watching them experience the film, but also everybody saying to each other, I didn't know that Terrence did this, and I didn't know that Terrence did discover, you know, they didn't know that about each other. And yet that's there from the very beginning, Terrence is, you know, seeing an actor and taking a chance on an actor and really believing in people. It's extraordinary. Can I say one other thing as a theater lover, I want to go back because the season this year is so, so wonderful and, and diverse. And um, you know, I, you know, I want to talk about Raul Julia for just a second, because I mean, I saw him do, you know, uh, Taming of the Shrew, you know, with Meryl Streep in the park. And I mm. saw him in Two General Brown. I mean, I saw his work a lot. And, you know, he was another groundbreaking actor because, you know, he was not limited to being an actor of Latin, you know, persuasion. He played every part. He was a tremendous leading man and, and a real role model for what really things should be. You know, everybody, you know, that kind of feeling of people should just, if you're a good actor, you know, uh, you, that's what you do. You just be a good, you'd be a good actor and you shouldn't be limited by, you know, something that people have just decided you are. And Terrence did that for so many actors. You know, but, yeah. and all of the American Masters uh, episodes that we see and, and have seen this year uh, touch on something that Terrence really drove home for me, which was that uh, genius or talent or whatever you do, it doesn't just come magically out of a bottle. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, I'm Bernini and I'm gonna make a statue. You know, it, it's, it's so much work and mistakes and failures and the courage to keep trying, uh, you know, uh, whether you're a poet or a science fiction writer or an actor or or, or, or a playwright. 
Um, and you know, Terrence talked about how uh, you know sometimes he thought he had this perfect draft of a play, and then it would just fail miserably on the first reading, and you have to dust yourself off and keep going. And I think that kind of um, understanding can 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 sort of inspire you no matter what you do. Well, you def you definitely feel. Um the word I use is irrepressible, an irrepressible energy from Terrence. He's just gonna keep going. He's gonna write that next play. Um, at the end of the movie, he said he has three plays going or three projects going. I, I hope somebody helped, maybe Tom Curtahay uh, helps complete them. Um, but that's really the mark of an American master is someone who um, just has to put what they have to say out there and it's, it becomes influential of everyone. Um, I mean, upcoming in our season is a film on Laura Ingalls Wilder, who sort of oh, shaped, love, the, love that. shaped the myth of the American West and pioneering in a fictionalized way, but she, she's kind of pretending that it's real, but she's drawing on her own experiences, and we deconstruct that. And, and, and how, old was she, how old was she when she first started writing? Wasn't she like in the Yes, yeah, so, so she's 65 when she publishes the first uh, oh, little House book yeah. in the midst of the depression. She's basically a, a, a chicken farmer, she and her husband, with very little money. And she captures the spirit of the frontier in a way that I think now it's 40 or 60 million books have been sold and generations have enjoyed the television show. So I think in that same way, just to tie it back to Terrence, because um, I know we don't have a lot of time, where American Masters um, is dedicated to finding those stories where someone has not just made a great play, but has shaped the culture, has shaped the way we think about the West, or we think about the LGBT community, or we think about um, music. Um, we have a film coming up on Michael Tilson Thomas and, and the way he thinks and, and has taught and, and continues to, to impact the world of classical music. I think so, we have one minute left. Can I throw a question to Marcia to close? Marcia, yes. what, what did Terrence teach you? I, I read all the Little House books. I had the entire collection. <laughs> but Marcia, what did Terrence teach you all, the, all this time later? You know, I think Terrence taught me, to, you know, the, the, about perseverance, you know, and to keep going and that, you know, creativity doesn't end just because you're old. You know, it's like, you know, if you want to make things and if you want to do things and if you want to be vital and active, it, it's, it's a limitless thing. As long as that's what you want to do, you can do all of those things. And I, I just to finish the thing, having met, you know, Angela Lansbury, you know, who was already like 90 and John Cander and some of the other people we met making <laughs> These people were in their late 80s and early 90s, and they're still working, writing new shows, wanting to still act. It, it was, it's an extraordinary thing to experience people whose desire to create is unlimitless. Wow, well, that's a great, great idea to end on. And I just say to, to documentary filmmakers out there, Marjan asked earlier about PBS, our door is open. Reach out through our website, whatever. If you're, if you're committed to some amazing idea, some story you want to tell, um, we'd love to hear about it. Let's say thank you to Marjan, to Michael Yuri, uh, to the organizers of this event. And thank you, Michael. And thank you, Marsha Ross, who I'll see downstairs in five minutes. <laughs> Great. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. Bye.